So I wanted to show Hugging Face Spaces today. These are very nice curated apps created by the community. We have probably seen some of them. So once you click on to the Hugging Face, you log in, you can also just sort by the most trending, most like recently created, recently updated. A lot of the companies or a lot of academics, when they want to make a demo out of their work, they deploy them on Hugging Face or Streamlit or Grad.io, these kind of interfaces. And I think it's a very good way to showcase your technology. So earlier on, people used to have to give you your code, their code. You'd have to download that. You have to run that, install on the dependencies. A lot of that work had to be done manually and at the client end. But such spaces just makes it very convenient to showcase a technology. So I just wanted to today pick one of them, Music Gen. This is by, I think, Facebook. So they are saying that they have a controllable model for music generation. So you describe a prompt, in this case, 80s driving pop song with heavy drums, synth pads in the background. You can condition on some melody and then you create something. Let's see if you can hear this or not. Oh, okay. Just one second. Let me. So again, showing that people like you and me, you don't need any skill nowadays. So I remember making a video for one of my paper presentations in 2016, and it took me four or five hours to find the right audio track, which will not have any copyright issues. But let's say if you today want to do something, let's say tabla, music fast, BPM, and we don't want to condition, let's okay, the page is taking some time to load. Sometimes certain browsers don't work well for me. Does that happen to all of you? Certain websites work on some browsers, they don't work on the other. OK, so let's revisit this in a few minutes. I tried out a few prompts, they worked out very well. Yes. So the question is, is this only instrumental or vocals? I think this is just instrumentals. OK, we'll, let's. So I'm generating two such music melodies, instrumentals. One is tabla music fast, beats per minute. The second one is happy, upbeat music using ukulele. And we just hear how the quality is. Right. So again, would have been perhaps very difficult to create such music. Like you'll have to learn an instrument, but you can put part of these in your videos if you want to create. Let's see, the second one is ukulele. So you can try various hugging spaces and have some fun. I was trying a few in the morning today. Dali Mini I tried out. It gives, it doesn't give very good results on human beings. I tried to create human beings sitting in a class, human beings doing this, that. But it works well on the kind of, the other kinds, of, let's say cartoon kind of images. 
So whisper I had already shown was the model which converts from speech to text. This one is a very fast implementation in JAX. So I think this is some x, some factors quicker than the others. And now we'll come back to the very basics after having seen some very cool demos. We'll be talking about linear regression. So linear regression you can think of as the first model which will help you to understand or get the base towards neural networks, which is what I think most of you are here for. So for when we say regression, it means that the output is a continuous variable. We have already looked at regression tasks. And we've already looked at certain kinds of simple linear systems in our earlier studies, like force equal to mass times acceleration, velocity at any time is velocity, initial velocity plus acceleration times time, so on. We'll be looking at this specific task today. We want to predict the weight of a person given their height. Do you think this is a good machine learning model to learn? Would you be able to predict the weight of a person looking at their height? You'd be able to probably do okay on average, right? Which is again something machine learning systems, if the metrics are not well optimized, you'll do good on average. But for the very specific cases, you're trying to build this model. Let's say you're trying to find out people who are malnourished, or you're trying to find out obese people. For such cases, just using height as a feature will probably fail. So we'll again use the first part of the data as training, the last part as testing. We may be able to create a data set like this, where we have plotted the data using these points. We can see that there are some kinds of outliers, people who are tall but way less, people who, who are, let's say, not that tall but way more. We can have these kinds of outliers. Now what we're trying to say is that can we expect on average to learn a linear relationship between the weight and the height? Generally, as the height will increase, the weight will also increase. Right? So whenever we talk about a machine learning model, we have, to we have to specify our certain assumptions. In this case, model makes assumptions. In this case, our model is making a simple assumption that our output variable weight is a linear function of the input features. So what we're saying is that maybe for the first individual, our model is some linear function of height, which is, let's say, theta naught plus theta 1 into height. For the second individual, second data set point, it's theta naught plus theta 1 into height of the second individual. And for the nth, it's theta naught plus theta 1 into height of the nth individual. So we'll see this pattern being repeated a lot. Whenever you want to deal with complex or whenever you want to deal with matrices, it's always easy to start with a simple vector, with a, with a simple scalar calculation. So weight of ith individual is a scalar. Height of the ith individual is also a scalar. And theta naught, theta ones are all scalars. You write all of these scalars. You stack them up. And we can then write for the ith individual this formula, the not, theta naught plus theta 1 into height of i. We can then convert these individual scalar equations into a matrix form. So my weight of i, these were n values, n scalars. I stack them up one below the other to make a column matrix. So n rows, one column, and I have two parameters which I will be learning through this exercise, theta naught and theta 1. No laptops, please. I see at least two laptops open. So we are learning two parameters, theta naught and theta 1. Why have we written this data in a slightly weird form? Previously, it looked very neat and clean, right? Theta naught plus theta 1 into height, theta naught plus theta 1 into height 2. Why suddenly we have a column of all ones. So again, let's look at this expression and see if weight of 1 will come out correctly using this matrix vector product. Weight of 1 equal to you look at the first row and the only column that you have. So 1 into theta naught plus height of the first individual into theta 1. Similarly, weight of the second individual 
is 1 into theta naught plus height 2 into theta 1. So, that is why we can write this matrix representation of the expression. We will look at this very often in the course. Start with scalars, stack them up into forming columns. The output variable typically in our machine learning course would be a scalar. You are trying to predict a single value and once you stack scalars you get a vector and the input features would typically be a matrix. We will typically have n rows and some d features and then in this specific case for this linear regression model we have two parameters. So, then if you want to write generally in this matrix vector of notation we can write the matrix w which is n cross 1 is a product of 2 matrix x, x which is n rows 2 columns and theta which is of shape 2 cross 1. So, very often in, in maths and in code I think if we just specify the shapes correctly we have solved a lot of the bug we have avoided a lot of the potential bugs you see. Theta naught as you know in a linear model we will say it is to be the bias term or the intercept term. What do you think theta naught here represents? What is the interpretation of theta naught in this model? The intercept is the mathematical representation in this specific model. Constant. It is a constant, but what does it mean? Yes, someone. Height. So, so let us look at this equation. Weight of i is theta naught plus theta 1 into height of i, right. If you want to see the effect of theta naught only, let us assume height of i is 0 then theta naught is the weight of the ith individual right. So, what does this mean? Theta naught is the height of people is the weight of people with 0 height again does not have any physical significance in this specific problem, but that is something you will also have to you will always have to be little careful about. So, you will have to see that these particular factors should be always bounded otherwise your model will produce negative weights negative heights these kinds of things which have physically no meaning. And how would you interpret theta 1? It is the slope term, but how would you interpret that? When? So, let us assume that height of an individual, let us assume height of an individual is 1 unit, 1 feet. Let us say if that person were to go from or we have another person whose height is 2 feet or 2 units. If you look at the weight difference between these two quantities, these two individuals that is theta 1, right. So, you look at weight of the first individual is theta naught plus theta 1 into 1, let us assume their height is 1, weight of the second individual is theta naught plus 2 into theta 1 because their height is 2 units. If you subtract out these quantities, you will look at the delta difference as per a unit increase in height or theta 1 here represents that when your height increases by unit interval how much does your weight increase. So, that is the definition interpretation of the two constants, two parameters you are trying to learn. In this simple example we had a one dimensional problem where x was only a single feature height, but typically we can have multiple dimensions. Let us assume we want to predict the water demand of a campus, we have seen similar problems earlier what all factors do you think the water demand of the campus depends on? Number of occupants, what else? Season, how does it depend on the season? Summer or winter, uh, you could, <coughs> can you, so summer or winter is what kind of a feature? It is a discrete feature, right. Can you make that into continuous feature? Temperature, humidity. So, would you expect to be using more water when the temperature is high typically and similarly with humidity, would you expect to use more water when the humidity is high or less water? So, I think this is where it gets a little confusing because let us say if it is more humid you may want to bathe more because of more sweat at the same time the institute might get more water from the rains. So, it might not lead to ok, so we are talking about the demand. Uh, the demand for let us say giving water to the plants may reduce if the humidity is high and it rains. So, I have to factor those things, but you could simply think of it as some some number of features 
like occupants, temperature, etc. Again, if we have to write this as a simple linear system, we may write that the demand is some base demand plus k1 times the number of occupants plus k2 times the temperature. Now let's talk about these different quantities. Do you expect the base demand to be a positive quantity or a negative quantity? Positive quantity. Why? So in, ex in the absence of occupants, you still expect some water usage. Where does that water go? It goes in air conditioning. Where else does it go? Plants, horticulture. Cleaning the institute, right? So it will go there. What about temperature? Do you expect K2 to be a positive quantity or a negative quantity? Positive. You would expect K2 to be positive as temperature increases. Generally, the, <laughs> the demand will increase. K1, do you expect it to be positive or negative? Positive. Again, positive, right? So it's useful to think of when you specify the model, what kinds of ranges your parameters should typically take so that your model becomes more interpretable. And if someone asks why your model is making certain predictions, you have some sense of it. This also helps you understand if there is some data problems which you have to fix. And as usual, the machine learning task is given the training data set. You want to learn a model. In this case, learning the model means learning these parameters, base demand, K1, K2, or in general, learning theta naught, theta 1 till theta d from the data. So in general, we would write, as I mentioned, whenever we deal with machine learning, we typically write uh, a record or a row as, so we don't write, sorry, as a sample as a column vector. Right? So it's n comma 1. In this case, it's D feature, so it's a D comma 1 matrix. Temperature of I and the occupants of the ith row. Estimated demand, I have put a hat around it. We typically put a hat on a symbol to indicate it's an estimate. It's theta naught plus theta 1 into temperature of I plus theta 2 into occupants of I. I'm just going to the more generic notation now. Or can I write the demand of the ith uh, ith, what would it be? Temperature occupants, ith setting, ith record to be xi dash transpose theta. Right? So I again go back and think that theta would also be a column vector. Right? Your xi is also a column vector. So if you have to get a scalar out of two column vectors, you'll have to do a transpose of one of them. Right? But I have not written xi transpose theta. I have written xi dash transpose theta. Right? What do you think this xi dash might mean? So we also had to account for theta naught term, right? Or the base demand. xi is length 2, whereas my parameters x theta naught, theta 1, theta 2 are length 3. So therefore, in order to, I can also write demand of i equal to 1 into theta naught, so, or theta naught into 1 plus theta 1 into temperature of i plus theta 2 into occupants of i. In order to compensate for the i, for, for the 1 constant, instead of writing xi, I write it as xi dash. So theta is theta naught, theta 1, theta 2, column vector. And xi dash is 1, temperature of i and number of occupants i. Or sometimes people just write this as 1 and xi, where xi is also a vector. So we have already seen the meaning of theta naught, theta 1, and theta naught. So now going forward, we'll be looking at this general format. We'll have n samples provided to us, capital M number of features which will then give us a matrix vector form like this. We have n examples which we want to use. So therefore, we have yi1 hat till yn, sorry, y1 hat till yn hat. This gives us n examples, which n predictions. I had capital M features. So my input matrix is going from x11 
through x n comma m n rows m columns and I have m plus 1 feature I'm m plus 1 parameters I am trying to learn. So, theta 1 to theta m corresponding to these columns and theta naught as my as my interceptor. And in order to ensure that I am able to do this theta naught into 1 calculation, I put the columns of 1s here. Right? So, always see for linear regression, if the number of features in the input is m, the number of parameters I am trying to learn is m plus 1. Right? I am also learn, trying to learn the interceptor. In general, I would then just write this as y hat equal to x theta. Right? This is the vector this is the matrix and this is the vector. So, this is my prediction for a certain number of samples, this is not my ground truth. Now, when we talk about the learning problem, let us look at this data which is shown in black and we have a few models which could have existed. So, the notion of a model here is different values of theta naught and theta 1. Right? I am showing you three possible values of theta naught and theta 1, theta naught equal to 0, theta naught 1, theta naught 2, sorry theta naught is 2 and theta 1 is 1 and theta naught is minus 2, theta 1 is 2. Which of them do you think is the best model? The blue one, why do you think that is the case? It agrees most with the training data, it describes the training data the best, right? How would you, so, so now let us imagine how you might go about finding such theta naught and theta 1. What is the naivest approach you could do and to figure out what theta naught and theta 1 might be? Sorry? Comparing. You can compare certain things. Could you just do a random sub -search, uh, search of all possible theta naughts and theta 1s and see which of them gives you the best fit? In this case, the best fit means the blue line. We will have to of course define what the best fit means. But that is another procedure you could have used. We will not use that, it is a very inefficient procedure. But we need to say, define mathematically which fit is good. Visually, it is very easy for us to say in this case, trivial case, that the blue fit is the best. We could have had another fit, y hat equal to 2 plus 1 x, which is shown in this yellow line. And I am showing the predictions as the yellow dots for each of the point in my x in my training data x. And now if you notice that I have a certain epsilon error corresponding to each, sorry this should be epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, corresponding to each of my training points. For my first training point I observe an error of epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3 and epsilon 4 for the four points. Now I will skip these things. Just look at the last terms. I do not want you to be looking at the initial ones just now. So, I am just saying that my y i, my epsilon i is, is y i, which is the ground truth for the i th sample minus y hat of i or the other way around, it would not matter. Right? So, my y i is, sorry, my epsilon i, the error that I am observing from my model for the i th point is the truth minus the prediction. So, how would you define a good fit in terms of these epsilons now? We will have to define how are we measuring the error. So, like so, we have defined the definition of the error for each point i that is y i minus y i hat. Now, that gives us epsilon of i. My next question is given all the epsilon i's, could you tell me what a good fit means? The epsilon what could be minimized? Total of the absolute errors, what do you mean by that? So, can you talk in terms of epsilon i's? Or let us simplify this problem. You have, you have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 4. What function do you want to say that quantifies the fit? Square or mod of what? Okay. So, we would say that a good fit might mean that each of the epsilon values is small 
but the magnitude of them, not specifically their with the directions. Um, they should be small. Or we could say that let's minimize or let's say that the summation of epsilon squares of epsilon is small. Why do we not say that summation of epsilon is small? Because some of them may get cancelled out. You may have certain errors in the positive direction and certain errors in the negative direction which will get cancelled out. So therefore, we could have had various ways to quantify whether a fit is good or not. One, we have said that each of the epsilon i's magnitude is small or the sum of the <coughs> sum of the absolute values of epsilon is small or sum of squares of epsilon is small, right. If we consider this definition, it means that we are saying that the L2 norm of the epsilon vector should be small, right. The epsilon is also a vector of n points. For each of the point, you have certain error from between difference between the ground truth and the prediction. Uh, for n points, you have an epsilon vector. You can <laughs> say that by minimizing the L2 norm, you can get a good fit. Similarly, another way to figure out the fit of the data is by looking at the L1 norm, which should be magnitude of epsilon 1, magnitude of epsilon 2, so on and so forth. There's a small type over here. So we now come on to how to derive this mathematically. Like again, in machine learning, we want to be learning the parameters theta. Thus far, we have had a qualitative understanding of what might be a good theta vector, but we have not really come up with an estimate of the theta vector. Right? So let's write it this way first. Our ground truth vector y is x theta plus some epsilon vector. Our x theta is our y hat. Right. We just saw that a few minutes back. Right. Our x theta is our y hat vector. This is a prediction vector for the n points. And this is not the ground truth. The ground truth is the vector y. But we said that the difference between the ground truth and the predicted is the epsilon vector. Right? That's as per our definition of epsilon vector. What is the size of the epsilon vector? Can someone quickly tell me? What is the dimension of the epsilon vector? n cross 1, matrix x, n cross, m plus 1, vector theta, m plus 1 into 1, and y, n cross 1. So y and y hat are of the same dimension. Epsilon is also of the same dimension. So our objective is now to learn the theta vector. Given the training data capital X and Y, we want to learn the theta vector. So we said that our objective is to minimize summation epsilon I squared. How do you think we'll go from this mention, this objective of minimizing epsilon i squared to finding out theta? The first question to you is, how do you even write this epsilon i squared summation in terms of the epsilon vector? So can you work this out in your notebooks? Epsilon vector is n cross 1 vector. It would help if you just write it as epsilon 1, epsilon 2 till epsilon n. From that vector, you need to somehow find out this quantity, epsilon 1 squared plus epsilon 2 squared plus epsilon n squared. You can just write it down so that everyone gets, can quickly write this down. I'm repeating the question. Your epsilon vector is epsilon 1 through epsilon n. It's a column vector. Using that, how would you write this quantity? Epsilon 1 squared plus epsilon 2 squared plus epsilon n squared. Epsilon 
Okay. So I have already heard three answers. All of them are correct. <coughs> epsilon is n cross one. What is the what is the dimensionality of this quantity summation epsilon i squared? It's a scalar. Does everyone follow? This is a scalar quantity. So going from an n cross one matrix, if you have to get a scalar, would you have to do a product of one cross n and n cross one matrix? So if epsilon one is like this, epsilon transpose would be a row vector. And if you do epsilon transpose matrix product with epsilon, you'll get summation epsilon i squared. Now, when you're doing the calculations, you could also just use the L2 norm, square of the L2 norm. You can do this calculation in various ways. But for today's purposes, let's just write that the objective is now to minimize epsilon transpose epsilon. So we'll now rewrite this. Our object, so given this equation, y equal to x theta plus epsilon, our objective is to learn theta which we are doing by minimizing summation epsilon i squared. But rather than now writing minimizing epsilon i squared, we'll say minimizing epsilon transpose epsilon. Right? So if you have to minimize epsilon transpose epsilon, what quantity do you vary to minimize epsilon transpose epsilon? So you have, let's look at all the matrices and vectors you have. You have a matrix X. Can you vary that to find a better theta? No. You have a ground truth y, can you vary that? No. You have a, a vector epsilon. Does changing theta give you a different epsilon vector? So each time you were in this case, if you were to choose, let's look at this. For the blue line, what is the epsilon vector? <coughs> zero, 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 zero. For the yellow line, what is the epsilon vector? 1, 1, 1, 1, or minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, depending on the direction that you take. Right? So changing the theta vector changes the epsilon vector, which means that you have to choose one theta, you have to choose a theta vector, which minimizes epsilon transpose epsilon. Now, whenever you have to find out the minimum of a function with respect to a certain quantity, what do you do? You find the derivative, you find the gradient with respect to that quantity, right? So your objective function, the function you're trying to minimize is epsilon transpose epsilon. It depends on theta in some way, right? So <coughs> let's do this exercise. Can you just write epsilon transpose epsilon and just make it in a, just simplify that expression for me using whatever you see on the current slide. Y equal to x theta plus transpose, uh, y equal to x theta plus epsilon, right? Epsilon transpose epsilon in a very, in a, in a simple way. There will be some terms which you'll have to combine and make it easy. Does anyone have an answer? So just write epsilon, write epsilon transpose, do epsilon transpose epsilon using some rules of matrix transposes that you know.
if anyone has finished this step, they can go on to the next step. Find out the gradient with respect to theta, set it to zero. So feel free to discuss with your neighbors. Be good if you can come up with a solution. Okay, does anyone have an answer? So that's why specifically I do this exercise in the class. This very simple looking thing is, it takes us time because we have not revised, we've not been able to revise a few matrix identities, etc. Okay, let's go over the steps. Epsilon was y minus x theta. Epsilon transpose is y minus x theta, the whole transpose. Now, y transpose is just y transpose. And x theta transpose is theta transpose x transpose. So, did you remember this identity? A into B, the whole transpose is B transpose, A transpose. Now, all you need to do is to just go on and I think many of you would have got the answer till this stage. Then I have a further simplification being done. I will just come to that. So, I just write epsilon transpose to be Y transpose minus theta transpose X transpose and I just do the multiplication now. So, Y transpose multiplied by Y gives me Y transpose Y y transpose multiplied by x theta gives me minus into minus x theta it gives me minus y transpose x theta minus theta transpose x transpose multiplied by y gives me minus theta transpose x transpose y and minus theta transpose x transpose multiplied by x theta gives me plus theta transpose x transpose x theta right. so now let's look at the degrees of these terms in terms of theta does the first term have theta? No. Does the second term have theta? 
Yes, it has what degree theta? How many theta does it have? One. How many theta terms does the, this term have? One. And how many theta does this term have? Two. So can we say this is a degree zero in theta? This is a degree one in theta. This is also a degree one in theta. And this is a degree two in theta. So similar to the way you would write something like y equal to uh, a plus b x plus c x squared. You have now written something independent of theta or one thing now two terms linear in theta and one term quadratic in theta. In matrix terms we typically get this kind of an expression theta transpose x transpose x theta which is you can think of this as something like an x square term. Now <coughs> why don't you do this exercise in your notebooks what is the shape of theta m cross 1 what is the shape of theta transpose 1 cross m what is the shape of or m plus 1 whatever you want to write so just write down the shapes of each of these quantities shown on the slide can you just do that in your notebooks once and you'll start getting some answers through this So write down the shape of theta and thus write down the shape of theta transpose and similarly write the shape of x transpose. Okay, I hope all of you have written down the shapes. Actually, I didn't need to do this exercise because of what I told a few minutes back. Epsilon transpose epsilon is a scalar. So, all of the expressions, all of the terms have to be scalars. You can't add a scalar to a vector until unless you're doing like in NumPy, you're doing broadcasting like things. But in maths, you're only adding scalars to scalars, which means y transpose y is a scalar, theta transpose x transpose y is a scalar, y transpose x theta is a scalar and this is also a scalar. Now if these two things are scalars, what is the transpose of a scalar? The transpose of a scalar is scalar, right? So can you find out, write down the transpose of this quantity, theta transpose x transpose y. In order to simplify that, just write it as let, let's write, uh, okay, anyway, I'll let you do this exercise. If you find out the transpose of this quantity, is it the same as this quantity? Yes. yes. If you're not convinced, break this down. Write this as A into B, and now you know AB transpose is B transpose A transpose. So if we do that exercise, you can write down epsilon transpose epsilon to be a constant or a term independent of theta minus y transpose minus 2 times y transpose x theta plus theta transpose x transpose x theta. Now you may have asked that why have we taken the, why have I written this, why have I taken a transpose of this term and written in the form of this, trans, this term and not the other way around because that's just the standard convention. So you have something multiplied by theta and then theta transpose something into theta. That is a quadratic in, in the matrix terms. So this is a scalar. So the input to this function is a vector, right? This function you're trying to minimize, the function epsilon transpose epsilon 
is a function of theta. You are trying to minimize this function of theta where the theta input is a vector. Right? So vector goes in as the input and scalar comes out as the output. You are somehow trying to tweak the values of theta f which minimizes this epsilon transpose epsilon which is a scalar. Any questions on this formulation? the last step going from this line to this line yes so all of these are scalars the transpose of a scalar is the same scalar right? so therefore if you take the transpose of this quantity you will get this quantity if you want to break this down just write theta transpose x transpose equal to a and y equal to b right so then you have a into b and if you take a transpose of A into B, you get B transpose A transpose. And if you then see B transpose was Y transpose, it comes here. And theta transpose X transpose transpose will come out to be X theta. So that's how you get this term repeated twice. Other questions on this? So I want you to mainly grasp this fact that you have a theta vector as an input to this function and you're getting a scalar as an output. You are trying to minimize this scalar as a function of the theta. So change the theta a little bit, so change the theta in a way so that the scalar output is minimized. Now <coughs> how do you find out the derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector? Have you done that earlier in any course? So the, this is a function, it is it's called a gradient. So this entire thing is a scalar, but you're trying to find out the derivative or the gradient of this with respect to a vector. Right. Have you done that earlier? Let's, let's take a small example to understand that. So this is a quick refresher of all the identities. If epsilon was a vector, epsilon transpose is a row vector. Epsilon transpose epsilon is summation epsilon is squared. Second, we saw <coughs> AB, the whole transpose is B transpose A transpose for a scalar S equal to S transpose. And now we want to find out the derivative of a scalar with respect to vector theta. So del S by del theta is what? We write that as also a vector. So derivative of a scalar with a vector is also a vector, so called a gradient where the first term is the partial of the scalar with respect to theta 1. Right? So think of the scalar s to be theta naught plus theta 1 squared, theta 1 plus theta 2 squared plus theta 3 anything. Right? It is some function from which you get a scalar value and if you find out the, you are trying to find out the derivative of scalar with respect to a vector theta, it is called a gradient. The first term is the partial of the scalar with respect to the first term of theta and so on. So therefore, del s by del theta has the same dimensionality as theta in this case. So it is called the gradient, we will come back to the gradient in a, probably in the next class, we will see if we can get to it today itself. So now, this is your objective, you want to find out the gradient of this quantity with respect to theta. Can you do that in your notebooks? Let us start with this exercise and then I will again show you some identities which make this calculation easier for you. So you want to find out del of epsilon transpose epsilon with respect to theta, theta being a vector.
So this is where you typically will end up looking at something known as the matrix cookbook. Has anyone seen this earlier? The matrix cookbook, has anyone seen this earlier? Okay, so this contains various identities of operations of matrices. A derivative of determinant inverse. It's a big book which gets very often used when you are trying to solve such things. So we could either directly pick up a result from here and show you what the derivatives are. But I wanted to give you a slightly easier way to remember these things. The derivatives of scalars with respect to various quantities and matrix vector combinations. So I'm not doing this the rigorous way. I'm taking certain examples to make it easier for you. <coughs> Let's say if A is a row vector. So row vector is 1 cross n. And theta is a column vector, which is n cross 1. A theta will obviously now be a scalar. So theta is theta 1, theta 2, and A is A1, A2. It's a row vector. A into theta will be a scalar 1 cross 1, which we can also write as A1 theta 1 plus a to theta 2. Right? So a theta is a scalar. Now we want to find out the derivative of a theta with respect to theta. Right? Let us again remember how we did it previously. If we have a scalar and we write it and we want to find it with the derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector, we write the scalar and each of the terms of the vector and find out its partial. So therefore, what will be del of a theta with respect to theta? Can you tell me the answer? What is del of a theta with respect to theta? How many think it's a? How many think it's a transpose? How many think it's not defined? OK, so you, I don't want you to do anything sophisticated. Just use the definition I showed in the previous slide. You have a scalar a1 theta1 plus a2 theta2. If you want to find out the derivative of the scalar with respect to vector or find out the gradient, so del over del theta1 of the scalar and in the second term we have del over del theta2 of the scalar again. Right? So basically this, this particular slide in action. And if you do it this way, you will get a1 and a2 which is now the a vector, but a vector is now coming in the form of a column vector, but the original a vector was a row vector. So therefore, del a theta by theta is a transpose. Now you could do this in more mathematically rigorous ways, I do not intend to do that today. But this is just to remember that we will have terms like this, del of a theta by del theta, that will be a transpose. So I had a term like this in this expression. Now if you have to do del of epsilon transpose epsilon with respect to theta, can you see that you have a term which is like a into theta? So you can find out the derivative of this quantity. You can find out the gradient with respect to this quantity. This thing is independent of theta. So the gradient of something which is independent of theta is 0. In this case, it is a 0 vector because theta is a vector. Now we have to find out the gradient of quantities like this with respect to theta. It's slightly complicated, but you can think of this as again similar to the quadratic gradients, quadratic derivatives that you're trying to find out. So let's do a simple exercise for this also. So we have a matrix Z which is of the form X transpose X. And we have to find out the <coughs> gradient of theta transpose z theta with respect to theta. This quantity comes out to be 2 times z transpose theta. Similar to the way we did previously, I took a simple example of a and theta. I did this calculation. Can you prove this? Using a simple example of z, where z is of the form x transpose x, can you prove that del over del theta of theta transpose z theta is 2 times z transpose theta? So work this out in your notebooks. 
So again, the purpose of this is so that you don't have to remember these formulas. You will have the confidence to be able to derive them with some simple examples. Of course, you have to assume here that theta transpose z theta is a scalar. How many have been able to show this? Okay, let's try for three, four minutes. One, it is that if Z is a matrix of form X transpose X, it has certain properties. Or if you're not able to identify, if you don't remember those properties, just create a simple X matrix, two by two matrix, and you'll be able to see that property in action if you do X transpose into X. Does anyone want to say that? What is that property which X transpose X like matrix uh, possesses? So, so it has to be square, that is symmetric. Symmetric is what I was looking for. Again, feel free to discuss with the neighbors if you need. Okay, let's go over a simple way to solve this. Let's assume your matrix X was A, B, C, D, two cross two. You can write X transpose to be A, C, B, D. You can do X transpose X. I've done the entire calculation, which is in this case, Z equal to X transpose X. 
it will come out to be a square plus c square, a b plus c d, a b plus c d and b square plus d square. You would expect these terms to be the same in this case for a simple 2 cross 2 matrix. Now <coughs> I can either use all of these terms or I can just for the purposes of this illustration I can make a simplified assumption. I know that z has this property z i j equal to z j i or z transpose is the same as z. So let us say that my z equal to x transpose x is this matrix E f f g. I have just kept E equal to a square plus c square and f equal to a b plus c d and g equal to b square plus d square because those things are irrelevant to me. Now theta is 2 cross 1 which is uh, theta 1 theta 2. If I write theta transpose z into theta in this form 1 into 2, 2 into 2, 2 into 1, I will get z transpose sorry theta transpose z theta to be e theta 1 square plus 2 f theta 1 theta 2 plus g theta 2 squared. Right? Again this, this entire term <coughs> is a scalar. So, if you have to find out the derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector, we have done this exercise two times earlier now. So, you find out the derivative of this entire thing with respect to theta 1, what is that? 2 e theta 1 plus 2 f theta 2. Similarly, the derivative of this thing with respect to theta 2 is this is not having any term of theta 2, 2 f theta 1 plus 2 g theta 2. And if you were to just write it this way, so 2 e theta 1 plus 2 f theta 2 and 2 f theta 1 plus 2 g theta 2, you can rewrite that to be 2 e f 2 times e f f g theta 1 theta 2, which is 2 times z theta, which is 2 times z transpose theta. So, which I want you to just note down these terms. So, just note down this identity in your notebook once. Del by del theta of theta transpose z theta is 2 times z transpose theta and <coughs> del by del theta of a theta is a transpose. So, if you written down these two identities. Now let us come back to our original problem. Okay. Now work this out in your notebooks. I want you to find out the gradient of epsilon transpose epsilon or I want you to find out del of epsilon transpose epsilon with respect to theta. Knowing the two identities that I have told you and set that to 0 to tell me what value of theta will you learn from the system which maximizes sorry in this case minimizes this function of theta. So, just repeating find out del of epsilon transpose epsilon with respect to theta set it to 0 you will find out a value of theta which minimizes this function. You have to tell me that value of theta.
Again, if you want, you can work out with the neighbors. You can get the solution with the neighbors, discuss it. Sorry? Oh. Some of you have got the answer as x inverse y. That's the wrong answer. X transpose. What is A? Almost there. Almost there. Not hundred percent correct, but it's correct. Almost there. x transpose x into you're trying to find out theta so <laughs> find out so find out epsilon transpose epsilon gradient with respect to theta set it to 0 and then tell me the theta hat okay let's go over the derivations we want to set del of epsilon transpose epsilon with respect to theta to be 0 we know that y is independent of theta Therefore, with respect to the first term, we get a 0, but it's a 0 vector to be a little precise. The second term is this entire thing, you can think of it as A. And we know that del A theta by A theta, sorry, del of A theta by del theta is A transpose. So, therefore, minus 2y transpose x, the whole transpose, which comes out to be minus 2x transpose into y. And del of del theta of theta transpose x transpose x theta is 2 times x transpose x theta. Now you put all of these values in. Uh, the question, okay, it's an interesting question. So the question is that we are taking x depends on theta. Why are we not taking y depends on theta? Firstly, are we taking x depends on theta? No, we are taking that y transpose x theta depends on theta because that has a linear in term in theta. Right? So, x does not depend on theta. Similarly, y does not depend on theta. So, x and y are the original data sets given to you. They have got nothing to do with your model. You will be using these to fine tune your model or, or to learn your model but you will not be able to find out the derivative with respect to theta for these data points. Okay, other questions in this? Okay, so now start with this slide and tell me the theta value that you learned. X transpose y upon uh, x transpose x the whole Upon. So matrices generally don't have the upons. Okay. Okay, so okay, so let me show the answer. Zero is the this side. So we write zero equal to minus two x transpose y plus two times x transpose x theta. Or take x transpose y to the other side. You cancel out two. You get x transpose y equal to x transpose x into theta. Right? Now, this is where the question comes in. How do you solve for theta? This is where <laughs> if, if we don't know the answers, we will we'll often make a lot of mistakes. What is the wrong answer you can give here? Sorry? Cancel x transpose from both sides, get, get y equal to x theta which was never the case because y is coming from the ground truth, y hat was x theta. And then you can, if you cancel them out, you can write theta equal to uh, x inverse y, which is wrong. X cannot be a zero matrix, uh, we can have an inverse. We can? We can have an inverse. Yes. Right. 
So, <coughs> so you pre-multiply both sides with x transpose x inverse and that is when we will get theta hat equal to x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. Questions on this? You can also. X transpose X is a scalar, so. X transpose X is a scalar, no. So, theta transpose theta would be a scalar, but X transpose X is a matrix. Sorry? What if X transpose X is not invertible? Good. Any answers for that? What happens if X transpose X is not invertible? Sorry? Yeah, we will come to that, but sorry? No, so, you are telling the you are telling the symptom, but the question is that what do you do if X transpose X is not invertible? Can you find out theta? So, I will leave you with this homework question also. What are the scenarios in which X transpose X will not be invertible? Or the scenarios in which X transpose X will not be a full rank matrix? Which means you should revise what a rank of a matrix is. Now, all of that can be done mathematically. But realistically, when will in machine learning problem will you get a situation where X transpose X becomes not full rank? We will see all of them in next lecture, but I just am giving the preface for that. Let us assume that for now the X transpose X is invertible for today's lecture, the next lecture it will not be. We can find out X theta transpose to be X transpose X inverse into X transpose Y. We can take a simple example like this and find out theta naught and theta 1. So, you have X and Y. What will be your capital X matrix? Is it 0, 1, 2, 3 or is it something else? What is the capital X matrix? If you have to column of 1s and then a column of 0, 1, 2, 3. So, if we were to do this exercise, we will create a matrix X to be all 1s and then 0, 1, 2, 3. We can find out X transpose first rows of 1s and then the 0, 1, 2, 3. We can find out X transpose X. It is not a scalar. You can verify here. It is a matrix because it is 2 cross 4 into 4 cross 2. We get a 2 cross 2 matrix. 4, 6, 4, 6, 6, 14. You can again verify it is a symmetric matrix. Now, using X transpose X and X transpose X inverse would be 1 over 20 this entire quantity. X transpose Y comes out to be this, this quantity 6 and 14. If you further solve, you will get theta equal to x transpose x inverse into x transpose y, which will come out to be 0, 1, which is expected because for this data, this has to pass through the origin if you fit a line and the intercept is and the slope is 1. So, therefore, the solution we have obtained is correct, although we went very, we took a very complicated route to solve this. So, the fit here is y hat equal to x. Let us play around the data a bit. Let us see, let us assume that for x equal to 4, we somehow have this outlier point now for y equal to 0. What do you think you learn theta naught and theta 1 to be? In the previous case, for this data, theta naught 0 and theta 1, 1. For this data, can you just tell me whether theta naught and theta 1 will be both positive, both negative, 1 positive, 1 negative? This is the data. So, you have to fit a line to this data and let us say I give you only 30 seconds. You have to tell me the slope and the intercept or just the signs. Intercept is negative. How many think intercept is negative? How many think intercept is positive? Majority think intercept is positive. Okay. Slope positive? Slope negative? So, the model that we learn is this intercept positive, 
slope negative. Seems counterintuitive, but that one point, which is the outlier, is influencing the model a lot. So typically, you would have expected to learn a line, but just because of this, if you've learned this straight line, which passes through the origin, the, the error epsilon 4 that you would have got would be a very, very large number. Right? So therefore, this model only cares about minimizing summation epsilon i squared. It doesn't care about what looks good to you. So you can, given this model, you can calculate epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 4, take the sum of squares, or for this specific model, you take summation epsilon s squared. For the three points, summation epsilon s squared is 0. For the fourth point, it's a very big number. That will end up dominating. So let's end today's lecture here. For the next lecture, I've already told you a few things to work on. Okay. Any questions?